The following program is a production of Tim Jackson, who assumes full responsibility for its content. The content of this program does not represent the views of FCTV, which serves as a forum for community expression and offers TV training, production facilities, and channel time to all Falmouth residents and organizations. Welcome back to the History and Heritage of West Falmouth as presented by the West Falmouth Library. I'm your series host, Tim Jackson, and today's episode is the first of a two-parter covering the economy of West Falmouth in the 1800s. We'll be talking about cranberry growing and sheep farming. But all of this information was researched by West Falmouth Library volunteer, Rene Borges. So without any further ado, here's Rene. Thank you for coming. This is our fourth talk and slide presentation that celebrates West Falmouth history and heritage. We received a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services in Washington, DC that was sent to the Mass Board of Library Commissioners and then distributed via a competitive grant process. And when I saw the grant description for Go Local, celebrating your local history and heritage, I thought, ah, oh, that's perfect. And so we were awarded the grant. It covers two years. Every month, we will be celebrating something different. So this month was economy. And when we started looking at West Falmouth in the 1800s, there was so much to celebrate. There was so much going on. I mean, think about it. Just after the Revolutionary War, a new nation finding its feet, um, getting ready to govern themselves, and then you get a bump with the War of 1812, and you manage to win that war after some significant casualties. Um, I don't know why that war is diminished kind of to the back pages of a history book because it was pivotal in terms of America finding its place in the world as a force, as um, a source for resources and products. And so the 1800s was very much an exciting time for everyone here in the U.S. and especially on the Cape. So that's our presentation for today. All right, I'd like to thank the researchers that came before me, primarily Dayo Jenkins, Jenkins, and Dillingham, and also my local contributors today. All right, which is Susan Myers, Linda Okagawa, and Milt Williamson. And then I'd also like to thank the Jackson family for being here to record this event. It will become a permanent part of the archives. Now I'm going to give you a minute to look at this because I thought this was interesting. If I'm in the way, I'll move over here a little bit. This is what was going on in the world in the 1800s, decade by decade. So you could just get a feel for what was being discovered, what was being explored, the spirit of entrepreneurship, uh, governments that were being established, regions that were being expanded, regions that were being reduced in terms of governance. And I forgot 1848, which was the American gold rush to California. And Bill Williamson did tell me that members of the Eldridge family took off to find gold in California. Many of your Falmouth families actually left the area and sought fortunes all over the U.S. The Giffords went to the Capitol Reef area out in Utah. Swifts went all over the place. There's even family in Alaska. Um, and we will study the individual families more so this summer. But it was, uh, when you think about the farms that were established here, in the 1800s, we're to the third and fourth generation. 
So as those farms are divided up, in families, it was not unusual to have eight to ten children. What happened is you got left with a lot to buy a house. And if you had ideas that were grander than becoming a tradesperson or just making enough money to feed your family, then you almost had to move from the community. Although enough people stayed that you'll recognize the names on that occupation sheet. If you didn't get it, it's back there now. John Hope Dillingham, he was vital in capturing the stories from West Belmont. Born in 1839, died in 1910. So he wrote down his stories in a memory, in a diary, the year before he died. And very accomplished as a student. Okay, went to film at the Academy, which was where students with potential went to when he was 12. Um, actually graduated high school and began teaching at 16. And in bold, I put down what he thought of Asherman. He was a first-year teacher. Rude, uncivilized district in the woods. And then he went on to go to Harvard at 19, uh, taught at Haverford College, uh, was a Quaker elder, uh, ran a Quaker school in Philadelphia. But he never forgot his roots here in West Belmont. And he would come back every possible time that he could just to live in the village to capture more stories and he's done a wonderful job of um, keeping history alive. So today we're talking primarily about farming and I'm starting with cranberries not because it was the first thing farmed in West Belmont. It wasn't. But it's the only farming still in existence today. The bog that uh, Dr. Miller started is still producing cranberries. So cranberries were native to the Cape. The Native Americans relied on them for uh, wound dressing, for uh, their pemmican, which is uh, mashed cranberries and meat. It's like a preservative to keep the meat longer. And then also for um, food. And this picture depicts the legend um, of a cranberry and a gentleman from Bourne. So if my guest reader would come up and please read aloud the cranberry legend for us. Good morning. Cranberry legend states that Richard Bourne of Sandwich was an early Christian missionary from Sandwich and a friend of the Wampanoag. The legend describes a spell put on Bourne by the local medicine man which caused Bourne to become mired in quicksand. The missionary challenged the medicine man to a battle of wits, which if he lost, he would serve the medicine man, but if he won, he was to be freed and troubled no more. Day after day, the contest continued with the missionary showing no signs of weakness. Unnoticed by the medicine man was a white dove that periodically flew down from heaven and placed a brown red berry on Bourne's lips. Eventually, the medicine man noticed the dove was feeding Bourne and tried unsuccessfully to put a spell on the dove. He <laughs> failed in this endeavor and conceded the match, saw the evil of his ways and converted to Christianity. <laughs> Cranberries on Cape Cod. It became a primary crop in the mid 1800s. Uh, the first official census of cranberry land took place in 1854. Belmont placed third with 26 acres in production. By the late 1800s, there were 1,074 acres. During the Civil War, they sold for 10 to $20 a barrel. By 1895, Falmouth was exporting 15,000 barrels a year, Falmouth alone. This picture is Carrie Medeiros. 
You still know that name. It's in, there's a number of the Madeira's family in Falmouth. She's age 12, picking cranberries on Swift's Bog, which are, which are the Kunamisset Kuna box today. And she started picking at age 11. A number of children also to support the family work the bogs. The picture isn't very good here, but um, Heinz, um, or Hein, who was working with the Library of Congress and taking pictures all over the US in the early 1900s, took this picture of Belford Coldus. He's eight years old, from New Bedford, and he's working a bog in Wakoit. There were 10 children working that bog from the ages of seven to 10, making a dollar or a dollar 50 a day. And they even had equipment specially made for children. And the children would work the bogs after school, some during school, um, whenever it was convenient for parents. And many of these families were itinerant. They would travel from bog to bog. So this is a picture of a Serbian family. You see the entire family um, on Swift's bog. Uh, housing usually was a hut on the bog or some communal structure where males would live, families would live. Now the Swifts are related to the Swifts here in West Belmont, three brothers. Uh, originally out of Sandwich, settled in Wakoit. And when the mill, the woolen mill on the Munikis River moved, burned down in 1894, the Swift brothers saw an opportunity. They went to Boston, got funding, and then in 1894, they hired Finns and Russians from New York City to drain the pond, clear the trees and the stumps, ditch and dike the bog and plant 25 acres. Okay. Migrant workers came from all over New England to work in the bogs. There were no child labor laws until 1938, even though lobbying for those laws began in 1906. So we're looking at people in the late 1800s that were looking for cheap labor. And this is a picture of Dr. Lewis Miller's bogs. I think if you walk that bog, which is on the property line between Felmouth, or North Felmouth and West Felmouth, you can recognize almost the background here. <coughs> um, and he, Dr. Miller, shipped his cranberries from schooners from the harbor down here in West Felmouth. In 1895, he shipped 800 barrels. And the bog is still there. It's just below Wings Pond. Okay. The Bowerman Homestead. The village of West Falmouth is bordered by two farms um, still in existence, although not operating as farms. The Bowerman Homestead to the south and the Crowell Born Farm to the north. Um, this was one of the first houses built in the village in the late 1600s. It remained in the family until 1981, but it was sold to a private buyer. The, uh, the road back to the house is private. Um, there's been some talk about contacting the family to see if we can't uh, figure out a time to offer a sort of open house later on this spring. And we will continue to pursue that. And here's another picture of the farm. Daniel Bowerman called the farm Poverty Hollow. <laughs> Chloe called it Valley Farm or Rock Farm. And Daniel was on the farm in the late 1800s when the farming economy soured. So that was probably why he wasn't real happy trying to make a living on the farm. And remember, too, that the farm was much smaller than when his ancestors had started it. Plus, it was poised on the edge of the Simbawisset Marsh. And so the farmland, I have a picture, and you can just see how rugged that was. All right. And then sheep farming. Okay? 
And so Linda Okagawa is going to come up and talk to us about sheep farming and sheep raising. West Falmouth was one of the biggest um, towns, villages, or whatever for raising sheep. So Linda, come on up and I'll pass the mic over and be ready to go. Okay, first I'm Linda Okagawa, as you've been told, and I, I wanted to say a couple of words about why I chose to research sheep farming here in West Falmouth. Until last spring, I hadn't paid much attention to the wooded area at the bottom of my driveway. Then Eversol has cut down a lot of large trees, and a number of them fell on the stones of what I knew was a historic structure. They misaligned the stones and they toppled down the historical marker. So realizing this, I was anxious to preserve our village pound, which is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. From the earliest settlement of the area, um, <clears throat> sorry, until about 1840, sheep raising was a central theme of the economy in the West Falmouth community. By 1831, Falmouth was the leading sheep raising town in the county. Much of this activity was in West Falmouth, which had the greatest amount of natural pasture, and in particular, an abundance of salt hay that was readily available as fodder. It was these gifts of nature that lured early Quakers in Sakonessa, Sakonessa uh, which is Falmouth, to form a community of their own on the North Shore by the Great and Little Sipawisset Marshes, which was a rich, rich source of salt hay. Now we'll talk a little bit about the land in West Falmouth. The dominant land form is a terminal moraine running along the, the back of the town here um, from Buzzards Bay, uh, along Buzzards Bay from Bourne to Woods Hall. The soil in this moraine, it's not barren, but it contains rocks of all sizes from pebbles to boulders. Sheep has always been a part of the mixed agriculture practiced by the early settlers. So they were a perfect match for the hilly pastures uh, where they were too full of rocks to allow plowing. <clears throat> the early settlers built homes on the flat land at the bottom of the hills, using the outwash plain for their crops and harvesting the salt hay from the marshes for their animals. The original purchases here um, were largely in the Sithawisset area, all the way up to um, uh, Hog Island, which is Chapel White Island. The first landholder of Colonial West Falmouth appears to have been William Gifford. In 1673, he purchased 40 acres of, of land at Sithawisset from a native uh, inhabitant. During the following decade, Thomas Flower Jr., Robert Harper, William Weeks, and Isaac Robinson Jr. purchased land on the Civil Wizard, uh, March and Marsh. <clears throat> Shortly afterward, they settled their lands at Hawk Island and West Falmouth. And to the north of Civil Wizard, 50 acres was laid out to Robert Harper, and they were bought in 1866 by his son-in-law, that's Thomas Bowerman from Barnesville, and a number of successful farms were developed. So those were the earliest settlers here in West Falmouth, and they practiced agriculture, and they began to include sheep. Now there was pressure after this uh, to develop northward. So that resulted in Thomas Bowerman, Jr. and William Gifford, Jr. Named, being named to negotiate the purchase from Sandwich of additional land. The lands were laid out in 1712. It, and so if you look at the, la the land, you can see that in the middle of the, pro the proprietor's way was um, uh, laid out from, the, uh, from, from north to south, and it cut the new purchase in half. There were hill lots, and then on the other side, there were plain lots. When the hill lots were laid out, which is really what constituted uh, West Falmouth, because most of the other lots are now a part of Hatchville, um, it was assumed 
At first, that each proprietor getting a lot would care for his own sheep. That's what they did. They laid out the equal portions of property and they bounded it with fences and walls. And then each strip, you can see that they had a long strip of property coming up from the water here to the hill. Uh, that was so that each farmer had pasture land in the hills and it had, and then uh, in the winter, you could move the animals down to where the salt hay was. So the new purchase, uh, you can put the next slide up if you want. Um, thank you. Um, this is a little hard to read, I guess, but <laughs> the new purchase enabled many new settlers to own land in West Falmouth. You may recognize many of the names associated with the Hills lots. And as I said, the Plains lots became Hatchville, so those names you know from that area. Despite the early settlers' plan, of laying out these lots to individual um, farms, it appears that the lots were never used to contain individual herds of sheep. Free range was preferred. <laughs> the flocks of sheep ran wild in the forest, as did hogs at the time, until it was time to, for them to be uh, relieved of their coats, and they were driven to Long Pond for counting and washing and shearing. Records indicate that the sheep of individual farmers were put into the hills as a group under the care of town-appointed shepherds with only earmarks to distinguish them. So in West Falmouth, actually, I, I learned that the shepherds often worked in a sheep yard on a hill above Long Pond. And I don't know if anyone has walked up there, but I understand there are still some stones um, in, in the, up near the new... Um, water facility um, that were remnants of the old sheep uh, yard uh, where the, the uh, shepherds worked. And now in addition, the walls were useful, so they were used as a means of preserving the quality of the sheep pasturage, sort of a rotate crop rotation scheme. They closed off the grazing areas that were overgrazed, and then they moved sheep to another area where there was newly grown grass. They didn't really care, I don't think, who owned the land. Uh, they just freely moved them around. In cold weather, the, the walls were quite useful. They could be used as creeps or shelters. The creeps were located where two walls met at an angle. Shepherds would create a three-sided room with a piece of canvas and then put another canvas on top so they had a roof. Um, so there were so many sheep in Falmouth, and they were often running uh, on common land, that the method of, a method of identifying ownership evolved. And they cut marks into the ears of sheep in a pattern specific to one owner. To the left on this slide here, uh, it, it shows that the pattern is, that pattern is cut into the left ear, and then on the right of the line is the pattern that was cut into the right ear. The earmarks was interesting because if you read the town meeting minutes from way back whenever, you always have somebody coming in to, to file his uh, earmark in the uh, town record book. <laughs> uh -huh. Now, with these free-ranging sheep and the composite herds, there were a number of paid positions that were developed here. First of all, I mentioned there were town-appointed shepherds. Then, the Commonwealth uh, required certain positions of every town. A fence viewer, a pound keeper, a field driver. Interestingly enough, I, I looked into the, uh, the uh, articles in the uh, town, I mean the state um, documents, and, it's, and those things were in effect until 1965 or something. <laughs> so, and I think many towns still have a fence viewer. Uh, which is kind of a person who, who settles disputes about boundaries and so forth. Um, so they've evolved into something more like the uh, Board of Appeals or something. <laughs> um, another interesting thing is um, they, they needed some bounty hunters. Wolves, in particular, were a threat to sheep, and the town paid bounties for killing them. So I looked up, there's some stories about that. 
and they needed sheep shearers when the time came because they, they needed extra resources and also the expertise of these uh, the nomadic sheep shearers who picked up work here and there. As, as mentioned now, impounding uh, was the method that the town came, came up with to uh, keep uh, the sheep under control. So they built a pound and appointed a pound keeper, not sure who it was yet, um, and then they, they charged fines to the owners to retrieve the detained sheep. In 1739, um, a vote was passed in town meeting about the impounding of sheep and it provided that the fines should be equally divided between the person who took up the sheep and the poor of the town. So this became a source of income for what was very important to the early settlers, and that was taking care of the poor of the town. Now, <clears throat> I, I don't know how much detail you want on, on actual um, woolen industry, but anyway. We'll probably save that for next time. Okay, because it was a very labor-intensive industry here, and, and most of what they had in West Falmouth um, was home production of woven cloth, and so we could go through all those steps and so forth, and why eventually some mills developed uh, to do fulling and carting to make the job for the local uh, housewives, so to speak, uh, easier. Now, the, the um, sheep, uh, decline. Do we have that slide? Yes, good. Okay. Sheep decline um, after the uh, in, into the 1830s. Um, in the early 1830s, Prince and Maltiah Gifford brothers and partners and the Bowerman family were two of the largest producers of wool in West Valley. Their fleeces have supported the home-based wool industry I mentioned, with the aid of the carding and, and, fel and uh, felting mills. This early success was followed by a sharp decline in the market for their products and in the number of sheep they kept. I ought to mention, although it wasn't a big uh, contributor, they also did sell mutton, so they, you know, they could kind of ship things around when the economy was changing. But in 1831, the first woolen mill opened in Falmouth. Eventually it expanded to include spinning and weaving. Houses for mill workers were built. People of all ages were lured from the farms to jobs that paid a wage. Here are all the steps in these mills, all the steps that the housewives did um, were performed. For, and they were successful initially anyway. In 1845, the Pacific Woolen Factory and the Wakoit Woolen Company employed 31 men and women and produced $25,000 worth of yarn and cloth. Now initially, the West Falmouth producers could have anticipated a growing market for their raw wool, and they might have even added a few sheep in anticipation of a new market, but they never did sell their wool to the factories. Evidence shows that the local mills conducted their business with other farmers, such as those on Noshon, where they had maybe 4,000 sheep. So uh, if you see this chart, oh, it wasn't there. <laughs> I moved on. Okay, I'll, I'll move on in a minute. The chart anyway demonstrates uh, how they, the, the number of sheep that these various uh, local farmers kept uh, after 1830 and, and to the, when they really phased it out, got rid of all the sheep in 1840. And the people, as, as others will talk about, they had diversified themselves all along. Some went whaling, some had salt work, some had other kinds of agriculture. So they were, they were able to move on from the end of the sheep uh, industry into other more profitable things. Now this is, an, is just a word. Here is the West Falmouth Town Pound. This is the thing at the bottom of my driveway. It has been cleared up cleaned up by Eversource, the stones are back, um, and they have cleaned it up. I have a picture, which I'll, I'll put a few of them on the back table there, which shows what it looks like. But it's, it's preserving the evidence of West Falmouth's sheep farming history. And so um, I'm, I'm trying, because I, I want this to have public uh, um, exposure, 
uh, to research the staffing and the funding and the operation of this pound. Uh, so if anyone comes from a family or knows someone who knows about you know some of the, the information about the pound back in the days when it, when it was uh, thriving, um, I, I'd love to, to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I was a little concerned in terms of time constraints, and then I was just forgetful. So the sisters must come up and perform their cranberry jingle. I think that would be a nice little intermission before we finish up. Okay, good morning. I am going to read half of the poem, and my sister, my twin sister, will read the other half. It will be a family event. When cranberries are in bloom, and it was written in the Falmouth Enterprise in 1897. Now the grower in wood fancies as he takes his yearly chances that he's solid and he dances, be sure to give him room. When the picker dreams of measures and many bogey pleasures, in his mind he counts his treasures when cranberries are in bloom. But both will come to sorrow for the cranberry worm will borrow the blossom on the morrow fold it around him like a tomb. <laughs> Though with enterprise and vigor, they have planned the profits bigger, is the worm that cuts the figure when cranberries are in bloom. An insect powder, PDQ, that's made by us for sale to you, not just as good but something new, will stop a wormy boom. And deal to vermin's death at sight, as sure as morning follows night. And as to price, oh, that's all right, when cranberries are in bloom. <laughs> Thank you for watching West Falmouth History and Heritage. A complete list of events can be found at www.westfalmouthlibrary.org. Tune in next month for the second part of this episode. Here is the handout Renee made reference to earlier the names and occupations of early settlers. To Renee. Um, I'd like my guest reader for the story of Simeon and the Cats to come up. And this is Sheila. I should have introduced everyone else, but you can go up and see the celebrities after and just <laughs> ask, ask their names. Good morning. The story of Simeon and the Cats. Simeon Bowman's house, later at my great grandfather, Nasius Dillingham, was just back of a cedar swamp. Simeon Bowman used to be troubled by wildcats, which would get into his cellar. Tradition is that someone advised him to get rid of all the cats by enticing them into the cellar to put an end to them. Accordingly, he baited the cellar with plenty of fresh meat, and into the cellar window came the cats until they made a large congregation. Then Simeon applied a great bag to the window, went downstairs with a cudgel, he scared the cats out of the window and into the bag. When now the bag became stuffed quite full of them, such was the pressure brought to bear on the sack by the incoming cats that the bag, bro the bag broke loose and rolled down the hill as a round ball into a swamp and let the cats out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, John Dillingham. Okay, here's a picture of the village landscape right in, um, in 1837 in the in middle of the 19th century. And as you look at this, I want you to imagine um, what this might have looked like. In 1812, there were 26 dwellings in West Falmouth. 
Um, now, there are 99 dwellings on the National Register of Historic Places. So this is probably a pretty accurate picture of what it was like. Now, as you look at this, I want you to imagine that there are sheep roaming everywhere, interspersed with cattle, hogs, horses, carriages, pets, itinerant travelers, and hundreds of children. So think about that for a minute. Plus, the landscape has changed a great deal. Not only did the livestock all right, take care of much of the forage in the area, but um, in 1855, West Falmouth exported 5,000 cords of wood, 40% of the county total. So just imagine this hillside covered with that much cordwood. And so uh, Linda referred to it, but in the mid 1850s, sheep, the raising of sheep was in decline, the raising of hogs was in decline, um, the acreage for the farms was in decline. So people were looking to find other ways to make a living and support their families. Many people from West Falmouth were whalers or mariners, and so they were on the ocean multiple times in the early 1800s. And then when they came home in 1850, then they had to make a living. So many of those mariners turned to skills. And some of them um, embraced, um, starting in the late 1800s, we had industrials visiting the Cape from Worcester, from Boston. And many of those descendants of the original settlers saw an opportunity to make money off these wealthy industrialists. And so we became a very trade-focused community at that point of time. Um, we had reference to Salt Marche. Um, this is a picture from West Falmouth. You see them out there with homemade rakes. And they would take the hay, rake it into staddles, and then pull the staddles from the marsh to the farm with horses or oxen. Now think about these marshes and getting heavy animals out there to pull a sledge out. This was not easy work. Oftentimes the sledges would become mired in the ground. This is what the farmland looked like. I promised you a picture of this. Hand plowing behind a horse. Okay? The major product, yes, in farming were sheep. But families also raised cattle, hogs, horses, grains, vegetables, and fruit. Okay. And this is a picture from the Bowerman Homestead. Much of this homestead was sold to developers in the early 1900s um, to become Seconset Hills. This is a historic view of Oyster Pond. Like I told you, a number of people became entrepreneurs. Um, Stephen Dillingham, oh, and I've got a misspelling there, forgive me, and William Gifford in the 1800s, mid-1800s, in order to control the harvesting of oysters and herrings, actually set up a company that could control the number of oysters and herring taken from the ponds and from the rivers in the area. Uh, this is another farmstead. This is William Gifford IV. Uh, this is the picture of his farm in the mid-1800s. Notice the pink granite barn in the background, which he built. Um, and with all of the animals in front of the barn, it's likely that this picture was the staging area for the railroad that was built through West Falmouth in 1870 to 1872. And next month in our follow-up program, we'll talk more about um, the industry that came into the area. And there's another picture of the pink granite. Pink granite is found all over the world. It is not unique to West Falmouth. However, the concentration of pink granite on the glacial moraine is unique. And it used to be much more prevalent, but it was used in buildings and structures, some of which have long since um, no longer exist. They've fallen down or they've been plowed under. Um, 
uh, Maury Harlow Hawks mentioned that a lot of the pink granite that was up behind the library on the hill was covered when they put in the playground. Um, this is another picture of another pink granite barn. This one was built by George and Daniel Weeks, who were mariners that when they got home became stonemasons. And uh, uh, George built his house using pink granite as a foundation in 1828, and he started the barn, but he died before it was completed. So his son Daniel inherited the, par the property and completed the barn. It just went up for sale, if anyone's interested. And then, uh, there's a story behind the pink granite that made its way to um, the Kennedy Memorial in Washington, D.C., and the Eternal Flame. And it's a story of Rufus O.D. Garland, an antique stealer, who I think kind of took advantage to um, Mr. Baker, and I've forgotten his first name. I have it. What was his first name, Neil? Do you remember? You know, I, I'll have it. I'll look for it later. Anyway, he had a bunch of stone in the back of his property at Baker Monument. The property's still there on Jones Road. And so Rufus showed up one day and pointed at the pile of granite and said, uh, how much do you want for that? And uh, Mr. Baker hadn't really thought about it very much, shot of a price, and he said, fine. The next day, two trucks came, loaded all the granite up, and left without really saying what it was used for. So he got very curious. He asked around, what, you know, why was it valuable? Who wanted that much granite? And no one was finally sure of what the rationale was. So he finally approached Rufus Garland in his antique store, come to find out that Jackie Kennedy would shop there. And after her husband passed, she looked to Rufus as a friend and as somebody local to find her pink granite to be used at the gravesite in Washington, D.C., the 3.2 acre Kennedy gravesite in Washington, D.C., and she wanted it left natural. And so that was the instruction, is to make it just kind of blend in with the rest of um, the landscape there. Um, a couple other facts before we end it about West Falmouth, and we're also going to have a couple more stories come up, is um, the square mile area of West Falmouth is 4.4 square miles. Of that, 1.3 square miles are water. Somehow, our, the ancestors, the descendants, found a way to live um, successfully in such a small space. So that's something to be said for the cooperation, uh, working together as a village and as a family in the area. So, and we still have that sense today. So now I am going to ask that um, we have, um, oh, I forgot to mention the fishing, the oystering, and the herring. Um, also, one thing to know about the herring is that it was fed, it was used to feed, um, to fish for cod in the area. So we were very much a fishing community, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, next month. So could I have my next guest reader, which is the Natives at Meeting, come on up and read that aloud for us. And you can introduce yourself too before you begin. My name is Judy Knapp. I'm from Las Cruces, New Mexico, actually. <laughs> um, so, the natives at meeting. I've spoken of the early Friends meeting house, but if tradition equals history, I cannot be sure whether theirs was the first meeting house thereabouts or not. For there is a story that once upon a time, an Indian's meeting stood on the bank above the river at the extreme north end of the harbor near the late Joseph Gifford's house and that the Indians were in the habit of taking their guns to meeting and to watch out the door or windows during the service in order to shoot wild ducks that might come up on the cove. The rule was that they might fire at ducks, but not go out to pick them up until after the service was concluded. Previous to the War of 1812, there were 
remember, 26 dwelling houses throughout West Fountain. One of these was simply a cave cut out of a bank, its front covered with boards. <laughs> Thank you. And now if I could have the young Kelly Scale, my reader, that would be you, Susan. <laughs> There's one name in here that I'm going to have trouble reading. I'll do my best. The Younger Kelly's Gale. This younger Kelly more than once recounted his memories of the September Gale, which took place on the 6th of that month in the year 1815, on his sixth birthday. He had come up from South Yarmouth with his parents to attend monthly meeting. It was a very yellow morning. People said something queer was going to happen that day. A strong gale blew up from the southeast till the tide in the bay was rising. Then the gale swung around to the southwest and blew up such a volume of tide among the beach hills and over them into the harbor that it flooded the upland road from Theophilus Giffords, James' father, to the schoolhouse near Charles Benson's and Chloe Tilton's and washed a cartload of Theophilus's pumpkins up to that spot. Then it flooded the road between Andrew Hamblin's and the late Nathaniel Coleman's and between the Jonathan Boyce house and Seth Swift's, making Joseph Baxter's house lot an island, filling up the cedar swamp and killing its trees with salt, salt water. The air is said to have been whizzing with flying boards of the salt works. Great havoc was made all along the coast. In the afternoon, the gale subsided, the sun shone out, the tide receded, and little David Kelly went out with his uncle, Theophilus, to help gather up the cartload of aforesaid pumpkins. <laughs> Thank you. So there are more great stories from John Hope Dillingham. Um, the Falmouth Library has back issues of the Falmouth Enterprise online. So if you're curious about Falmouth history, at West Falmouth history at all, you can open up all of the back issues of the Enterprise going back to 1897 and search for specific names or events. Okay. Um, so that concludes our farming. Um, we'll get into um, other things next month. It's the last Saturday of the month. I thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to end the presentation now um, and end the recording, but I'll hang out for a few questions or comments if you have time to do so. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation on the economy of West Falmouth. This program has been sponsored by Sheer Illusions, and I really want to thank Wayne for turning that into this. Anyway, see you next month. But until then, here's a look at some of the exhibits that were on display during this recording.